John Kitzhaber is at the very top of people who approach, that I have seen, who approach this topic of health reform in the most authentic, the most sincere, and the most meaningfully thoughtful way. I just cannot be more impressed with him every time I get a chance to hang out with him. So I'm really honored that he has made time to be with us today. Let's welcome to the stage former Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Good to see you. So uh, you were here for lunch? I was. Where were you sitting? I was sitting just uh, back where Eric is right now. Kind of hiding a little bit over there. Uh, let me ask first with uh, your thoughts on what you heard from the lunch speakers. Um, well, I thought there were some really interesting points. I think uh, um, Director Allen made a really interesting comment about the social determinants of health, which you know we act as though it's something brand new. <laughs> Uh, been around quite a while, and I think the real challenge with the social determinants is not, I mean, there is the funding issue, but I think the real issue is where do we pick up, where do we start the screening, where do we actually, how far upstream do we go? And I think he was alluding to the fact, and so is uh, Janet to some extent, that we actually don't have a cogent early in intervention delivery model. We've got a whole host of state, federal, local agencies, we've got CBOs, often they compete with one another for funding from the same sources. And uh, I think the real challenge is figuring out the role, uh, the appropriate role of the coordinated care organization in actually delivering uh, the social determinants of health. Maybe we can come back to that because CCOs aren't housing authorities or social service agencies, and we don't want to medicalize the problem. But that, but you know, defining the role is, is, is I think, pretty important. Eric uh, mentioned the whole issue. He sort of alluded to it. Uh, the whole question of, of uh, for-profit entities uh, delivering. Um, Healthcare that's funded with public resources, and I think that's uh, that's worth uh, that's worth talking about. Is there a difference between uh, building up reserves in a not-for-profit coordinated care organization versus a corporate model that is designed to maximize revenue for a shareholder outside the state of Oregon? And I think that's a very legitimate question that we're going to have to come to terms with one way or another here yeah. in, uh, in Oregon. Let me ask this: You know, one of the th one of the arguments you made, uh, I guess, in two thousand. 12, may have been 2011, but when you were saying, look, if you take the CCO model and you apply it to all of the other states, you're going to be able to wipe out the deficit, you're going to be able to wipe out a significant part of the debt, you're going to be able to fundamentally transform government financing in the United States. Why have we not seen other states adopt the CCO model when it does seem like there's a lot of self-evident uh, good stuff in that approach? Well, I think, uh, I think part of it's due to the, sort of the culture here in Oregon. You know, we've had 30 years of experience, collaborative experience, starting with the Oregon Health Plan back in uh, 89 and, and 90, uh, which was a collaborative model. In fact, half of the CCOs grew out of IPAs that were created 25 years ago to care for the Medicaid population. Uh, and so I think we've, had, uh, we've been blessed with having leaders in the health sector that were uh, collaborative, that had a, a good basis of trust, uh, and I think that uh, is, is part of the substrate. And I do think, uh, to be fair, the CCOs uh, took advantage of a perfect storm. Uh, we were in the middle of the Great Recession. We had a $1.2 billion hole in the Medicaid budget that would have, if without new revenue, we, e we either would have uh, disenfranchised tens of thousands of Oregonians from Medicaid or dropped about a 39% cut on the provider community. And that created a certain um, intensity and motivation to come together and find that third alternative. But I think what we have demonstrated, certainly there are flaws and there are areas that we were not able to get to, but we have demonstrated that it is in fact possible to expand access, another what, 385,000 people under the ACA we brought on, and still operate within the 3.4% growth cap. At least the state did. Now some CCOs did and some didn't. Uh, but uh, it is possible to expand access and uh, uh, and, uh, and, and manage cost. And that is an element of the national debate that's not there. I mean, Medicare for all, we can get into that. I've completely endorsed the value proposition, but essentially that's expanding access to the current hyperinflationary inefficient system. And so I think expanding access and managing costs have to go hand to hand, both from a financial and from a political standpoint. When you reflect back on the initial vision of CCO, what we call CCO 1.0 now, do you think that uh, the first transformation period met the goals as initially envisioned back in 2012? It met some of them. It certainly didn't meet all of them. So we wanted to create a new 
uh, organization that was uh, community-based, that had local providers, a local governance structure, engagement of local citizens that would look beyond the traditional clinical model and take a more holistic view of community health. I think we definitely uh, achieved that, uh, particularly in some of the smaller uh, uh, CCOs that grew out of these IPAs that had been in the community for, for, for years. We wanted to demonstrate that you could operate, at least that the state could operate within a growth cap without sacrificing quality uh, or outcomes, and I think we've demonstrated that. Uh, we wanted to expand this to the commercial market. We wanted to start with PEB and OEB, and then, um, and then maybe as an option on Medicare Advantage, and then, and then on the exchange. We did not get there, and it's really clear you cannot transform the system just using the Medicaid population. It has to be broader than that, so that's work to be done. Uh, one of the things that I think we that has gone by the wayside, or at least appears from outside to have gone by the wayside, is the whole notion of a learning collaborative. Uh, part of the original waiver, and this was Don Berwick's insistence, is there was a required a formal learning collaborative. And so we met every month or six weeks with the CEOs and chief medical officers of all the coordinated care organizations in the same room at the same time, which really uh, allowed us to learn from the, the, both the successes and the failures that we have. And I think the, the decision for whatever reason not to include past experience as a part of the RFA, uh, I think we lost um, some of the, the hard fought lessons that we've learned as, uh, uh, in terms of sort of applying those and figuring out where we want to take the, uh, the next iteration of CCOs. You've been publicly concerned with the next phase of the CCO model. Um, do you think that, um, let me sort of just ask this kind of overly simplified question, but do you think that CCO 2.0 is the right moniker? Is the CCO 2.0 really an extension, in your view, of the first CCO, or is it meaningfully and substantively different to the point where maybe a different moniker would make sense? Um, well, so I, I have had concerns, and I've shared those with, uh, <clears throat> with the governor and the, and the, Dem and the legislative leadership. It's, it's not clear to me where uh, the current administration wants the CCOs to be five years from now. Um, it, uh, it, it appears from the outside that, that we're moving away from a, a local, community-based, innovative, collaborative partnership between the agency and the coordinated care organizations to a much more regulatory, uh, punitive um, um, insurance model. Uh, and I think that on the current trajectory, it, it, we could end up five years from now with the old MCOs that we have spent five years trying to, trying to escape, and that does concern me. And, you know, there's been a significant increase. So let, me, let me say that I don't think anybody objects to more accountability, more transparency. I think we have to have that. Um, and we need a whole, we definitely need to do that. But we've moved from, I think, 60 different administrative rules and regs up to about 200, and 12 new categories of, of civil penalties at the same time. And my question is, what is the problem that we're trying to address? So if, if the CCOs have come up short, and they have, for example, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a significant variation, regional variation, in the ability to operate within the growth cap. Um, or if there are specific areas where there has not been adequate transparency, what are those and how do the uh, regulatory rules and regulations and reporting requirements actually address those uh, and move this model to the next level? So we need to know what the next level is and we need to know what the problems are, the obstacles are that are keeping us from moving to the next level. And to me, that's still a little bit opaque. So where, what would you say, you know, if you have some new legislators here and you're you're holding conversation with them and they were not around in those earlier days. Uh, how would you, and they said, what, well, what do you think, if, it, if the goal of CCO 2.0 is not this extension of CCO 1.0, what is, how is it meaningfully different? Where is the policy, we can talk about whether there has been a policy change and where that has occurred, but where is it going if it's not extending CCO 1.0? Well, I think it's a conversation that we, we ought to have, and I'm not suggesting that the current administration can't change the policy direction. They, they certainly can. It's just not clear to me what the policy direction is. The, there's no question but that we need to do a better job integrating, I mean, really integrating behavioral health, not just financially, but at the point of delivery. And I think the, the, the CCO 1.0, and these nomenclatures sort of bother me a little bit, but the first version of the CCOs uh, was sort of a journey of 
of a light enlightenment about behavioral health. I don't think people understood the, the extent to which behavioral health underlies so much of the physical health uh, world and, and, the, and, the, and the driving cost. And I don't think people were aware of that. So now we are. So that is one thing that we ought to actually uh, tee up and ask ourselves how we're going to address that. And I do think the social determinants of health, I think we need to step back first and ask ourselves what is the appropriate role of the medical system in addressing the social determinants of health and then how do we integrate that. I don't see how you can do that unless you have a collaborative um, partnership with the, with the CCOs at the local level. Because you know, healthcare is a local transaction. It's not a publicly, it's not a, a, a traded sector. If it was, it wouldn't cost nearly as much, for one thing. But the fact of the matter is healthcare occurs uh, at, at the local level with a provider and an individual. It is local. And I do think the secret sauce of the coordinated care organizations is that local flavor, that engagement, that sense of ownership by the local community. So I think if I were to advise the legislature, I think, I think, I think it would be worthwhile at least to put a pause button on for a moment, not in the contract process, but in the sheer volume of the rules and regs, uh, and say, what is, it, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? No, what is, the, what is the policy? Do we still embrace the direction we set up five years ago? And if not, how has it changed? And then what are the problems that we face in getting there? And then how do these rules and regulations and, and, and civil penalties get us there, right? It seems to me that taking a month or so to actually answer those questions would alleviate a lot of the concern, a lot of the confusion, and, uh, and put us in a better place to uh, move this to the next, uh, next level. You know, some people would say we have uh, community entities that are nonprofit but very profitable that are otherwise based outside of Oregon, like Providence based in Renton or Kaiser based in, in uh, Oakland. So what's wrong with entities that make a margin and that are based outside of Oregon. Can't they be connected to the community just like Kaiser and Providence are? Well, they can. Uh, the, I think the larger question, we, we were talking earlier, I was on a panel with Senator Flake uh, down in, in, in uh, we were in Las Vegas of all places. Um, so apparently everything that happens there doesn't stay there because I'm gonna share this with you. Um, <laughs> but we were talking about, they were, had a long uh, conversation about value and waste in the system. And we were talking about the private equity firms that are now investing in the healthcare system. And some of them, I assume, are actually trying to develop ways to provide better care at a lower cost. Some of them are buying specialty clinics and rolling them over in two years and making a 400% ROI. So if those are public dollars and the, and, and the, whole, the purpose there is to feed a shareholder, uh, is that waste? Is, that, is there value? I would argue that if those are public dollars, there's not a lot of value there. And uh, I would say Providence was a little different in that it's not a publicly traded company, although you can look at its profit margin and wonder, you can look at its profit margin, its margin and wonder. Just leave it there. Yeah. Um, so what, you know, we've got ourselves in this tricky political situation. I mean, even though you have enunciated this question about the policy vision clearly, I'm not sure what question would get drafted in a bill for the legislature to take action on. I'm not sure what the legislature could do uh, other than say, yeah, I think we're going in the right direction. I mean, Pat Allen would say there has been no change uh, in the policy vision of CCOs, I believe he would say, uh, except that we are going to hold some parts of the CCO model more accountable. We're gonna work harder on things like behavioral health. We're gonna work harder on social determinants. We're gonna make sure that uh, uh, that there's more transparency around um, uh, financial performance, but that the vision hasn't changed. So I, I feel like it's a really tough spot if you're a citizen legislator to try to be responsive to your call when you've got a governor ostensibly, I don't know that Pat is still here, maybe he is, but uh, who would say there hasn't really been a policy change here. Well then, uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting there's a bill that we need to pass. But I think there's a larger conversation. It's not, I'll give you an example. It's not clear to me what the, what the objective is. So trying to push Trillium into the Portland market. Let's just take the elephant in the room here. So why were we trying to do that? Was that because that we, we thought competition would be better for the very vulnerable people who depend on the CCO in Portland? I mean, I mean, <clears throat> who got helped by that, right? So we have a contract let initially when none of the Portland hospitals have signed a contract 
when the county commissioners objected to it. So, you know, the whole idea of local buy-in and local um, um, support is, is an issue. <clears throat> um, the first week of this month, letters went out from the health authority telling members of the health share that they were being reassigned to Trulli which didn't have a contract at the time, and by the way, is suing the three Portland hospitals. So now we're gonna have to send letters out telling those people that, oh, by the way, you're not going to Trillium, and, but six months from now, you might get another card saying you are. So I, I'm not quite sure what we're trying to do to keep the Trillium um, Portland venture on life support, because the people who are getting confused, the people who are getting disrupted are incredibly vulnerable people whose biggest concern is not what provider network they're in, but where are they going to get their next meal? Where are they going to connect? The, where, where's your home going to be? And my question is, if this is all about providing better care for vulnerable people, and as Janet Meyer says, recognizing that Medicaid is the scaffolding that helps people move up the, the income ladder, um, it's not clear to me what we're trying to accomplish there. And I, that's just a larger statement. I'm not, this is not, should not be, this is not personal. It's just that we've got a million people on this care model and actually it worked pretty darn well for five years. And I think that we need to make sure that CCO 1.0, uh, you know, is solid. You know, why did the three CCOs east of the mountains operate under 3% and the others didn't? You know, what, and it just seems to me that we're adding a lot on it's creating an enormous administrative burden, so people are chasing the, the reporting requirements and the deadlines to make sure that they're not penalized. And there's no, there's no room, there's no capacity to think about transition. There's no capacity to say, what did we learn, and how can we apply that going forward? So all I'm suggesting when I say push the pause button and say, we might be on absolutely the right track, but let's just slow down a minute, let's bring the CCOs to the table, let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve, the obstacles we're trying to overcome, and then let's start again together. What do you think about John Quincy Adams? You know, he was president, then he decided to return to the legislative branch. Yes, he did. Are you well, enjoying retirement? He's dead now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever thought about re-entering uh, the legislature? No, but I will say that um, the eight years that I spent as Senate president were probably the most rewarding uh, years that I had. I mean, that's, you know, that's when we did some of the seminal stuff. And, you know, it's great, it's, we, we are really lucky in, in Oregon to have the kind of uh, governance structure we have, and we get petty and pissy with each other, but, you know, it works a lot better than it does in most places. Yeah. What has been, sort of, have you, do you have a set of observations about Oregon now that you have been more actively engaged outside of Oregon? You've come to speak at some of our conferences, you've been, done a lot of consulting work outside of Oregon. Uh, it, it, has it given you sort of a unique perspective on this state and the, the transformation experience here that maybe you didn't have when you were thigh deep and wading through it all? Uh, well, it's given me, um, I think, a deeper appreciation of something that I think I already knew, and, and that is the, the, just the inherent goodness of people in the state. I mean, that they're, they're, the, the desire to build community, you know, the desire to kind of get around um, not just bitter partisanship, but, but, but polarized stakeholder positions, a, a willingness to sit down and, and uh, build relationships and, 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 and grow together. And that doesn't exist in a lot of states. You know, we've had a really interesting transition here, not just in Portland, but around the state. A lot of the people that set up those early IPAs were in their 40s and 50s, and now they're in their 60s and 70s, and they're on their way out. We've had a complete sweep of the hospital leadership here in Portland. Um, people who, who don't have that background or experience, or experience with one another. So it's gonna take a, some time to kind of rebuild those relationships. I think everybody wants to do it. Um, and I think that we need to work even harder here in Oregon because back in the day, we had a lot of companies, including healthcare companies, that were headquartered here. And now a lot of our major industries are outside the state and you know, they don't have the same kind of uh, um, investment, uh, community investment that you would have if you're actually headquartered here. So, uh, that means that the rest of us need to step up and, and reinforce that ethic of collaboration and community building because at the end of the day, that's the only way we can actually make this state better. What do you make of the Democratic candidates for the de uh, nomination for president, the candidates for the Democratic nomination for president? What do you make of their approach to health policy during this cycle? 
Well, I think the, the, the reason the national health care debate is polarized, there's two reasons. The main reason is that neither the Republicans or the Democrats assume any change in the underlying care delivery model. You either pay for it or you don't. So uh, repealing the ACA or defunding the Medicaid program is lowering the amount of money you're paying for the current system, and Medicare for all is spending more money to pay for the current system. And you can say that you, know, you get rid of some administrative waste by getting rid of you know, private insurance companies, but that doesn't deal with all the other perverse incentives in the system and all the other cost drivers from prescription drugs to you know, uh, specialty clinics to it, it, it goes across the board. So um, in, until we can recognize that, let me just add one more perspective. Healthcare, if you think about it, is the only economic sector that produces goods and services that none of its customers can afford. I mean, there's nothing else like that. And the only way this works is because the care of individuals is heavily subsidized increasingly with public dollars, either directly through Medicare and Medicaid and CHIP or indirectly through the tax exclusion for employer-sponsored coverage, right? And um, uh, there's a great saying from Thomas Pinchon's book, Gravity's Rainbow, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And we've been asked for years, we've been asking about the subsidies. We've been focusing on who pays them, how much they are, and who gets them, rather than asking why does healthcare cost so much in the first place. That is not a debate that's going on in Congress. In my view, the Republicans don't have a healthcare plan. Their healthcare plan will be tailored to shoot holes in whatever the Democratic candidate brings up. And the Democratic candidate, if it's anyone that's on the stage today, is simply going to try to figure out how to expand coverage to a system that's failing us. So, you know, one of the reasons I feel so strongly about the Oregon Coordinated Care um, effort is it is an effort that's actually trying to address cost. It's trying to put cost and access and quality in the same equation. And there's really nowhere else. I mean, Medicare Advantage does that to a certain extent. But this is a 25% of our population, 60% of our kids. And if that falls apart, I think we lose one of the few working models in this nation that our Congress could look at and say, actually, it is possible to do that. And uh, so I think there's a lot more at stake here than just uh, the survival of uh, a quality care delivery model for a million uh, vulnerable Oregonians. Do you think that there is room in a Medicare for all slash single payer construct to employ the CCO lessons and, and do it within the political tailwinds behind the idea of single payer on the left, but have the mechanics be a, a CCO-like model? Well, I mean, I think the, uh, I, I get frustrated with the, um, with the sort of narrow view on a single payer versus universal coverage, because they're, they're two different things. Single payer is one way to get to universal coverage. But in the CCO model, we haven't said private commercial insurance companies can't participate. We've got Pacific Source that's uh, doing very well. We've got Moda, right? We've got, I mean, we've got a variety, of, and Medicare Advantage is the same way. It's essentially a capitated model uh, that doesn't exclude uh, one element of the current system, but it does provide sideboards, and it says this is how much you're gonna get, and you're gonna have to operate within that and produce good, good clinical outcomes. And in other words, it shifts the risks down to the providers so they can actually manage care. And um, the concern I've got, and, and I, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not, this is not meant to be critical at all, but, I, uh, but you know, Senator Warren, who has now got the more detailed plan on M Medicare for All, I mean, I totally buy into the value proposition, but knowing that those things that have the biggest impact on lifetime health status have very little to do with medical care. Healthy pregnancies, housing, nutrition, stable families, education, you know, a good job. Why in the world would we spend $20 trillion on a medical system that we all recognize has 30% at least waste in it, instead of putting that into housing, and instead of putting that into economic opportunity and community redevelopment. And so this whole debate is about coverage and it's about medical care. It's not about health and communities and, uh, and um, uh, dealing with the uh, enormous opportunity costs that, that we have in this system and the fact that we're leaving our children with a staggering burden uh, of debt uh, because we didn't have the courage to invest in their future. It just kept investing in a system that uh, is unraveling on us. I'm not very optimistic about the quality of the, I don't think much is gonna happen nationally on healthcare actually, regardless of who gets elected in the short term. Really even, I mean, I agree with you, but let me just be devil's advocate for a minute. If a Democrat were to win, and if uh, a Democratic Congress were to, um, 
you know, earn a majority. Don't you think the political tailwinds behind healthcare on the left are such that something has to be done? It won't, I'm not saying it will be fixed. I'm just saying that there will be well, victory declared. Yeah, well, victory will certainly be declared. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, if you look at the, if you look at, I'm on the board of Families USA, which is really interesting because they were one of the major opponents of the original waiver for the Oregon Health Plan. Um, but, but if you look at the political strategy, the democratic political strategy, what, what, you know, um, the concern people have with healthcare is cost. But it's not really system cost, it's the cost of them and their families. And, and the way that manifests itself is in surprise billing or uh, prescription drug costs or insurance policies that don't cover much. So the, the messaging that the Democrats are using is, are, is directed at promising to fix those things. But those are all symptoms of the total cost of care. The, right, they, they, they didn't cause the total cost of care, it's the other way around. And so uh, if, they, if they promise they're gonna lower people's medical costs by dealing with those, those areas, they're not. Uh, they can probably get some of those things through and they should be addressed. We shouldn't have to deal with surprise billing. But those are the not, the, it's the, the driver here is total cost of care. And I, what I learned from the CCO model is that the only way we fix this system is you've gotta have a hard cap on what the public sector is gonna spend on medical care. And I'm not saying you suddenly drag a lot of money out of the system, but you slow the rate of growth to something at or below the CPI and shift the risk to the providers. Because otherwise, there is no fiscal discipline in this system. Uh, and um, we continue to spend more and more money on things that have a marginal impact in terms of the health of the population. I wanna sort of ask this kinda, of just to get your reaction to this study that I read recently uh, from a different state that said across 47 indicators, uh, not all of the healthcare system, but across 47 of the most meaningful indicators in healthcare, uh, waste was down 10% over the last, I think, three years. And that, that was meaningful, uh, and that now we only have 51% of our total spend as waste. <laughs> at least on those 47 uh, indicators. Um, I wonder if incrementalism is just a self-evidently failed strategy in healthcare. If we pat ourselves on the back that we're almost not a majority uh, of our spend is, is, is almost not wasteful. Do we, you're a little bit more, I mean you're, you're I would categorize you as kind of an incrementalist, like you, you look for things that work and, and you drive towards data-supported evidence-based solutions, but maybe this is a Gordian's knot where we just need a big blade and have to be more dramatic. That's certainly Elizabeth Warren's argument. What do you think? Well, I think, you, I think that, uh, that incrementalism has to, be, um, has to be viewed in a context. In, you're taking incremental steps towards what? We haven't answered the what, which is, again, one of my concerns about the CCO 2.0, right? I mean. What was it the Roman Senator Seneca said? No wind is the right wind if you don't know what port you're sailing for. To me, if we could agree, and I think this is true, that at some point in the next five or 10 years, we are gonna be operating on a, a, a significantly constrained budget because the percentage of public reimbursement as part of the payer mix is gonna just, just continue to go up because of the aging of the population. So public reimbursement is gonna be the driver, right? And you, you can only charge 400% Medicare into the commercial market for so long before people figure out that they don't want to do that anymore. So you've got these big self-insured employers taking steps to sort of shield themselves from the cost shift. So if we were to say, we know we're gonna to have to operate under some kind of constrained budget, and we all knew we were gonna do that, what are the incremental steps to get there? So if you're an insurance company, what are you gonna to have to do to survive? How do you have to change your business model in order to survive it or thrive in that environment? So for example, if you talk to a hospital or if you talk to um, some of these capitated physician groups about Medicare for all, excuse me, about Medicare Advantage, they'll say, well, we don't like Medicare Advantage because the health plans use denial as a cost, as a risk adjustment tool, so that's good news. So then how do you create incentives so that you can't hoard the risk, but you move that risk down to the providers where they can actually manage the care? So you, you, there has to be big time reform, and we've done some big time reform in Oregon, it requires a really clear idea and consensus about where you wanna end up so that you have some benchmark to determine whether the incremental steps are moving you towards that and away from it. And until you can create that endpoint, if you're a hospital or a CCO or Centene or, or a labor union, you don't have a way to understand what you have to do to change to get to that shared future. 
So there's no context for the debate. And that's the problem we have, I think, right now in, in, uh, in, in, at, in, at the congressional level. Questions from you all? Becky, uh, right up here. Uh, why don't you wait here, uh, Michael, we have your, or over here? Great. Uh, give us your name and your organization, and fire away. Uh, Mike Huntington, retired radiation oncologist. I work with Physicians for a National Health Program. And I would like uh, both of your uh, thoughts on something called modern monetary theory, <laughs> yes. the trickle up way. Yeah. Um, you print the money, you, you uh, pay the construction workers to rebuild the infrastructure, pay off student debt, create single payer. That money gets back into the economy because the people in those income brackets have to spend money to live. So uh, this is uh, this modern monetary theory. Unfortunately, comes from the, my party, um, and it basically says as long as you have a printing press and can print money, you don't have to worry about the national debt. Uh, this is insane, if you ask me. <laughs> it's a way to spend more without having to make difficult choices. And the fact is that our um, our debt to GDP ratio is really out of whack, and at some point. Um, that, that actually doesn't work anymore. Spending on infrastructure uh, will help you pay, you know, if you're gonna spend, if you're gonna put public resources into building infrastructure, infrastructure, you know, creates good construction jobs and it's a, it's a hard asset to, that you have for a while, but you reach a point where the amount you have to pay on your, uh, on your national debt begins to undermine that. And we're actually at that, at that point where just infrastructure spending doesn't actually solve the problem. We actually have to reduce the spending side of the equation. And it's, you know, our kids learn this in third grade. And um, um, so I, I think that's an excuse for fiscal discipline. And I'm, you know, I have no problem spending public dollars and have done it proudly. Uh, but it ought to be spent on something where you can measure the outcome that actually has a lasting value. And um, uh, I think this is just, uh, uh, a, a, an effort to avoid making those difficult, those difficult choices. And in this case, it's to spend more money on medical care and not more money on all the other things that Democrats say are important to them, like housing and education, spending down student debt, et cetera. So I don't like it. Thank you. DJ, don't you have a comment on that as Yeah, he said both of us, but I'm going to take a hard pass on that one. Nobody cares what I think. Hi, my name's Angel Prater, and I'm uh, executive director of a nonprofit, which is a consumer-run, peer-run organization here in, in, in Portland. I'm wondering, large system, how do we start putting regulations on the pharmaceutical companies? Because I think the pharmaceutical companies, therefore, are driving some of where we're at and where we're stuck. And I might get murdered at some point in my life because I say this a lot. I'm watching, I'm watching your back. Yeah, watch my back, OK? Um, I think it's really important to note that people are dying 25 years earlier than the average person if they've um, been diagnosed with a psychiatric condition, primarily because of the physical health, but then also the medications or, or the side effects. And suicide numbers are up, yet all of the medications pretty mm -hmm. much say risk of suicide, and we're not looking from a whole health perspective. So. How do we look at this from a global perspective mm -hmm. when the United States, it's $2,000 a pill for one medication, but in another country, it's $2. So I think that they're in, mm -hmm. in largely in control of a lot of what we're, we have going on here, and we're creating more of the same. Mm -hmm. And so how do we avoid creating more of the same and start putting regulations on those who are in the invisible class um, with all the power and profit? So um, there's a book, I don't know if you've read it, by Elizabeth Rosenthal, who's, who was a New York Times reporter and is the head of Kaiser Health News. It's called An American Sickness. And it is a powerful expose of the greedy financial underbelly of the US healthcare system. And I think it, it will have as much impact as the, the jungle did at the turn of the last century. Uh, and it's not just the drug companies. It's, 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 you know, right, it, it's everybody. It's the whole thing. Um, so I, this is simplistic, but I think one way to begin to get at that is to pool, pool the purchasing power of that part of the system that's financed with public dollars. So that's 110 million people right now. 
Uh, if you were to expand Medicaid to, let's say, 200 or 250 percent of the federal poverty level, which I think you need to do, you, you shouldn't be dumped into the individual market unless you can actually afford it. So let's say we have 150 to 200 million people in a pool, and we negotiate prices. Now, not, so we repeal that portion of Medicare Part D that prohibits the government from negotiating prices, but we don't stop there. We do medical devices, we do ambulatory surgery centers, we do hospitals, we do doctors. That may sound like a, a radical idea, but think about it a minute. What we're saying is that the government is going to get the best value um, and price for its constituents, which are the taxpayers. Why do insurance companies consolidate to get market leverage to drive down prices? How, why do hospitals consolidate to get marketing power to resist that? I would say that the public sector is an outlier in terms of fully participating in this widely accepted uh, um, of, 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 of mar mar market, market tool. So I think there's some simple paths there. Uh, you gotta get that through Congress, but, but I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's insane that we don't use that, per that combined purchase. Every large employer does it. Uh, we, we should be doing it on behalf of the public sector. Let me ask a, a question in follow-up to her comment about suicide and, and drug use and mortality going down for white America. Um, it's a unique thing that's happening where uh, mortality rates, um, you know, our, our life expectancy is falling, um, but really just in, in white America, uh, and really just in middle class and working class uh, folks, um, white America doesn't need, I mean, nobody needs to feel bad for white America so far as our history here, but um, that's a unique thing that's happening that we've not really seen before. And you give a lot of thought to economic inequality and other structural issues well beyond healthcare. I'm wondering if you have any economic observations about that, that um, really unique phenomenon that's tied to economic opportunity, that's tied to drug use, it's tied to behavioral health. Any thoughts on, on that uh, life expectancy cratering among uh, white Americans? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's not created among all white Americans. Right. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, I think this is, uh, it's cratering among uh, those, I mean, the biggest cratering comes with people who are in generational poverty. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the healthcare system uh, is, a, is, a, is a reflection of the larger economy. You've got these enormous wage and wealth disparities. You've got people working it was the hospital in what, Memphis, Tennessee, that was taking its own employees to court to collect uh, payment for bills they couldn't, they couldn't pay. I mean, why, why, why should we have uh, a, a sector that grew right through the recession, um, added huge numbers of jobs, uh, and many of those jobs are at the absolute bottom of the pay scale? Uh, so I, I, think, I think it has to do with income Disparity. I think it, 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 it poverty. It comes down to that, and it, it just strikes me as um, it's, it's very troubling that we have a system that's now consuming 20 percent of our GDP, uh, and um, the questions we ought to be asking if we're going to reduce, let's say, we're going to reduce hospital beds because we're doing a better job out in the community, instead of asking how many people do we have to lay off, the question is how do we retrain some of the people who are working in the hospital to well-paid community health workers? How do we actually raise the wages? Of the, of the growing hospital workforce. How do we raise the wages for, for community health workers, for home health aides, for those uh, 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 um, categories that are gonna be so important for an aging population and professionalize them and give them benefits uh, and make them proud working Americans? I mean, I do think that, that, that the challenge of our medical system offers us an opportunity to address uh, the, the, the fundamental challenges that we face as a society. And, um, I don't think we should waste the opportunity. And one, uh, one more quick question over here. Is this on? Yeah. Um, you spoke about the learning collaborative and pausing. I know you. Hi there. Um, and pausing a bit to learn, bring everybody together who has a lot to share with each other. And it seems that absent that, we might be fostering competition and varied agendas. What do you think it's going to take? I wasn't even aware that that wasn't even that that wasn't continuing to happen. But what do you think it's going to take to get back to that? Um, is that leadership calling CEOs together to have that conversation? Well, I you know I mean I think uh, um, 
I mean, my obvious, obviously, since I served 14 years in the legislature, it seems to me that, that you know, the, the, uh, the coordinated care organizations are a product of legislative policy, legislatively adopted policy. And I think the question is, is that, are we still on track? And, and, and then, again, that's not, this is not a someone did something wrong question. It's just a question of there's a lot happening right now. People are drinking out of a fire hose. And because this is such a big deal and because we have 25% of our population in this, in this, in this system, we should be very deliberate. And, and uh, you know, there are concerns. You've all heard them. Uh, and, and instead of pointing fingers, we should say maybe, let's take, take a moment, let's ask ourselves what it is we're trying to accomplish. Are we still, do we still want to go there? Do we want to go somewhere else? Uh, and then um, identify the barriers to get there and what do we need to do together to, to, to do that. That conversation, it seems to me, would be, is very timely and, 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 and very important. Who should call that conversation? Well, it would either have to be the governor or the legislative leadership. I mean, that's the, that's the policy arm of the, of, of the state. Let me tell you, I really appreciate your thought leadership on these topics and others. I know it's uh, uh, every time you stick your head up, and somebody throws a dart at you. I'm just it's part do. of the deal. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you very much for your work. Let's give him a round of applause.